Hello there. Welcome to this episode of Forest Ghost Conversations. This is your host, Anthony King, and this week I'm going to discuss the seventh episode from Ahsoka titled Dreams and Madness. Before we get started, I'm inviting you to join the conversation with us. We can be found on Twitter and Hive at Forest Ghost Pod. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok just by searching Forest Ghost Conversations. Also, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on your listening site of choice. Plus, Forest Ghost Conversations is live on Patreon. If you're a fan of the podcast and would like to consider pledging your support, there will be a link in the episode description for you to check out the various tiers offered. Finally, please be sure to check out our Tee Public store to buy some Forest Ghost Conversations merchandise. And without further ado, it is time to gather around the campfire for some Forest Ghost Conversations. Alrighty, everybody, welcome back to another installment of Forest Ghost Conversations, continuing the Ahsoka coverage that we are doing here on this podcast. And we are at episode seven, Dreams and Madness, the penultimate episode heading into the climactic season finale, which we, of course, will have an episode on next week. But, of course, we have to get to the penultimate one before getting to that one, which there's a lot of interesting stuff to discuss in this one. So full spoiler warning ahead for anybody that may not have seen Ahsoka. Um, Come on now, go on Disney Plus and watch it. You've been warned from this point on. Also, just for some housekeeping things, again, as you may have heard in last week's episode, or if you didn't hear last week's episode, go listen to last week's episode and then come back to this point. This is a pre-recorded episode, mostly due to the holiday season, mostly due to, uh, also in part due to recording schedule, because we have uh, a guest coming on for our episode eight discussion, and um, I wanted to be sure that our episode seven, and six and seven, frankly, because I had to record sixes yesterday, was done in advance of that, so that it was a fresh discussion in in all that um, processes there. So... I know that means nothing to the listener because this will come out on a weekly basis here. But uh, yeah, that's just some general housekeeping stuff. So anywho, back to the point of it all. Because I was uh, go pre-recording these episodes, I do not know what the, the news is of this time period entails. So basically what that means is there is no Cloud City gossip for the next couple of weeks here, going back to last week too. Um, uh, since I, I don't have clairvoyance to see what else is out there. Uh, Rebel Moon is out. I know that is a thing, so at the time of this release, at least. Um, So go watch it on Netflix. Go support it. Um, Support uh, this new universe that's coming out. We're going to be talking about it very soon here on Force Coast Conversations. So very excited for that coming up very soon here. Um, So yeah, just get ready for that. And um, uh, whatever news does come out, if anything does, before the next time we get to a Cloud City Gossip, we'll do our best to kind of compile all that into one thing so that uh, you are as caught up as can be. But usually during the holiday season, they kind of slow down. Everyone's kind of taken off and they don't make big announcements um, because usually PR people aren't aren't working or marketing folks, communications, all that stuff. The, everyone takes, takes a little bit of a holiday break so that they can come back rejuvenated in the new year. So generally there isn't a whole lot to cover on that front anyways. Back to the point at hand though. Let's get to... Episode 7 of Ahsoka, Dreams and Madness, a title that derives itself from a line in Episode 6 when Balin Skull says this is the land of dreams and madness in regards to Peridia, uh, which is an interesting title. I mean, it is obviously a place of madness if you want to look at it from that perspective. As we talked about last week, there's a lot of death and destruction um, the clearly the the Night Sisters want to leave this place, and Thrawn wants to leave this place, but the Nati, the Howler, um, the you know, just Ezra's existence, right? There's a, the other side of that coin too, where people are thriving, they're making the best that they can out of the situation, they're living, they're enjoying their lives, they're 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 peaceful. So all that's in play here. So both are true at the same time. And just the mere existence of this place existing, frankly, is something out of out of myth, fairy tale, legend, 
Um, Balin talked about that in, in the previous episode as well, where, you know, he was saying like, this is a place that was talked about as a fairy tale, the Jedi temple. And then it leads us to believe like, what, what else is potentially a fairy tale that was taught at the temple? Um, you know, maybe the, the Mortis gods, the Ark, uh, that the whole Ark is, is, is something that is a fairy tale or something in legend. Right. But as Filoni once wrote, or, you know, I don't know if he actually wrote that line or not, but it was in Rebels. Um, the famous line of there's always a little bit of truth in legend. So the fact that Balin is now seeing this come to fruition and, and there's some truth to this, right? He went on this path to see if this is true or, or not. And he's got his ultimate game plan and goal ahead, which we'll talk about later as, as his path kind of separates from Shin Hattie, his apprentice. So um, we have, I got some thoughts on that one too. But the episode starts with the trial of Hera, right? The court martial of Hera. Obviously, what she did in the previous episodes, episodes four and five, going against New Republic orders to support Ahsoka and Sabine on this mission and CTOS was not up to code, if you will, was not approved by the Senate uh, Defense Committee. Uh, I think that's what exactly what they are, or something to that degree. And... She's now on trial for misallocating use of New Republic resources for that effort. And also disregarding direct orders and all that stuff. So that's why she is on trial here with a panel of folks that are kind of familiar. It looks like that group that was on the hollow net or the hollow call. in I believe it was episode two at this point, or maybe it was three hard to tell. Remember off this off the top of my head. Senator Ziono, of course, as we remember from that interaction, is kind of on brand for how he is. Again, that is um, Kaz's dad from Star Wars Resistance. And we you know what happens in The Force Awakens, Last Jedi, The Rise of Skywalker, that leads to this, that, that you know, the, the full culmination of the actions done here, right? The letting go of Imperial folks to rejoin the new republic while also they are forging their own way ahead infiltrating all the various aspects of the new republic government and when you have enough people turning a blind eye to things that's how the the foundation of the first order starts chancellor mothma is there too kind of leading this tribunal and I loved Hera just in this instance in general, where she's kind of really having this great clapback session with Senator Ziono, right? Where he's like, you're just misallocating use on your resources here. You're going off on these wild goose chases on your own personal vendettas to find Ezra Bridger. And, right, you know, that is an emotional trigger for Hera, naturally, because she saw Ezra almost as a son, basically. And then I love this, like, the whole thing of, no, no, I was not ignoring orders. I was just ignoring you, right? Like, you know, he was the one that was the most vocal and most adamant about not letting Hera go into this mission. And, you know, they threw out these words like, oh, those are sensational terms. Like she's talking about Moff Gideon and a reference to the actions on Mandalore in season three of the Mandalorian, where the, you know, (laughs) the whole shadow empire of that whole aspect of that episode and him creating the new Dark Trooper program and um, all the cloning and all that stuff that was happening there. And then they're like, no, that's you're sensationalizing everything here. Gideon was just a warlord acting on his own. There's no immediate threat to this Republic. And like Hera is absolutely right there when she also claps back again. Again, there's a whole like a clapback season here. She's like, no, it's just your will- unwillingness to see it, right? It's obviously we can't, look at every person that's an imperial like you know we have to let some people that were former imperial still work in this new republic system but there has to be a better way to recognize potential threats that are existing here but it's just that fine line of this is a brand new republic here and in order to have a functioning government quickly in the aftermath of uh, an empire falling they had to cut some corners when it came to that And because of that, this is kind of laying the foundations and the seeds for what we will eventually see in the rise of the First Order 
and then later on the force awakens and the sequel trilogy events loved having a c-3po cameo it's awesome to see anthony daniels back in the fold again on behalf of leia organa too leia for the win if you ask me right and uh leia gives like the approval of like i authorize this mission you you guys did this behind my back <laughs> um i didn't need to tell anybody for secrecy all that stuff ziono is like how can we take on the, this testimony of this droid it's mere droid right mere droid my butt in a way i mean chopper 2 also flips out of that one chopper is great in the court sequence carson teva holding him back there just wonderful great comedy slapstick humor in a way and the great star wars um humor in my opinion so that was the whole trial chancellor mothma is also kind of you know aware of what's going on she's like i can see through like leia didn't authorize anything here you're writing a tight line here i have so many hands in the pot that are like you know when you're running this whole system it's it's really tough i understand mon mothma's position a lot more at this point it's just it's, it's hard it's hard operating a government i mean we go on this note all the time and again there has to be some better way and they chose Maybe they chose the quick and easy route, right? Maybe they chose a dark side path in order to start up this new republic so quickly. But they had kind of had to in the aftermath of a of a government with you know, Operation Cinder happening and, and all the events, you know, Battlefront Two and 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 the aftermath trilogy. Like, there's just so much happening at the same time. But you know, I I don't know, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard. And obviously, the the results of these choices take out a certain way. So maybe there was something they could have done along the way, and maybe that'll be presented in these stories that we get across this overarching Mandoverse, and maybe comes into the Mandalorian movie when Thrawn returns and all that stuff. I don't know. We'll have to see. Just some food for thought on that front there, because you know, as we talk about governments and what we can apply to our real world, it's it, it's just one of those things that it's like no system is absolutely perfect. So Ahsoka makes it to Peridia before we get them. We get a little bit more of Anakin Skywalker, which it can never hurt, frankly, especially after what we saw in, in that set, in that episode five sequence. Um, these are some of the Clone Wars tapes that he made for Ahsoka that, about uh, her training and lessons in order to continue um, doing these like lightsaber techniques and all that stuff. I love that it's showing that Ahsoka not only went through this rebirth and regeneration, she's going to go back to her basics again in order to relearn how to be a, you know, connected to the system that she was once before. Um, it also shows that she's a lifelong learner and willing to go back to the basics. I talked about Neil Pert um, in our episode five discussion about a person that had went through an uh, incredible tragedy and then took some time away from the thing that he loved to do the most, which is drumming, and then was able to, after several years in time, came back to it and basically had to relearn how to play again because he was playing at such a level. And trust me, like I'm trying to do that now myself. Once you go away from doing something like that for so long to have to kind of put yourself back in those shoes again, it's like there's a lot of muscle memory to relearn. You have to put yourself into a position that you can relearn that stuff again. Um, so it's it's just one of those things that you, know, you ha kind of have to start back from the beginning and, and practice and patience and time and just all that stuff goes into it in order for you to be the f most fully fledged and well-round person that you can be. Training is important, obviously, too. And it shows, again, she's willing to go back to basics again after what she went through on CTOS. Now, <laughs> I will say, too, just another character relationship here, you know, um, Thrawn makes the full attempts when Ahsoka comes out of the hyperspace and the Purgle to take her down as, as quickly as possible. He kind of, you know, in the last episode, he's like, tell me all about her master. I want to know everything about her. And, and Thrawn had his run-ins with Anakin, right? He has those stories from the Thrawn alliances, and he was able to decipher who actually Darth Vader was, that he was General Anakin Skywalker from the Clone Wars, this person that he had this adventure with back in the day. Um, so he was able to anticipate based on history what her actions and, and motions would be. Um, so he's able to do that. But again, there's the stuff that he's not able to predict, like connecting to the force, turning, like all that stuff that he's not able to actually like foresee. Like Thrawn is such a master at determining like what person's next move likely is. But there's always that like 0.005% chance thing that he's never anticipating that 
always comes to the forefront. Like he can only, he can only divert so many resources and efforts to the one thing that's probably most probable. And then that's ultimately his downfall at the end of all things. I do. I do think that it's brilliant though. And, and stays true to the character of Thrawn that he would do such a, such a thing like, like that. But again, she, she couldn't can like, he couldn't possibly contrive her connection to Sabine, especially with someone that has been so, lackluster and force and force training and all that stuff um i will say too like sabine not being obviously truthful with ezra is totally painful to see in this episode but i did love the force connection between ahsoka and her padawan and you know i'm going to spoil a little bit of it for episode eight here get just jumping ahead here but you know i i'm just trying to think through the grand picture of of this whole thing the ahsoka tano uh, sabine relationship that's clearly been at the centerfold of this entire series Maybe this force connection is something that helps Sabine to become more in tune with the force, right? You know, I think we talk in the real world that seeing is believing a lot of times. Like if you're doing something and you're practicing something and you're not able to actually get it and someone does it in front of you and like you're able to see it happen, then sometimes it just clicks in your head in a different way. Um, I think it's good for them as, you know, to be in sync with each other, even just for a second as master and apprentice. I think that helps their relationship as they're able to have that kind of connection in episode eight. Um, so all that's there. Um, and I think, yeah, maybe that is what allows her to believe in herself a bit that she can have some force abilities and push Ezra over that, that whole, um, that whole space in order to get him into, the um into the um the the star destroyer so he can go home right even though he does say i think i may be going home after all we will see <laughs> we will see like you know careful what you wish for boss like you may be going home alone uh you know it's all that fun 2020 hindsight stuff that you you watch this episode and you're like great let's get to it i think you may be going home after all but you know there's a whole dark side to it it's like yeah you go home but you're connected to thrawn here and now that he's there it brings about the the new coming the glory of the shadow empire that now gets to wreak havoc over the galaxy and potentially create another galactic civil war and then the remnants of that will also tie into the first order which also has you know overarching problems for the galaxy like destroying the new republic and the hosnian system the resistance is almost defeated to a to a pulp very shortly after that. I mean, Starkiller is a loss, but then it takes a couple of years for them to have their ultimate victory. And the Emperor returns too. like all that incredible stuff is 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 kind of like the fallout of, of these choices here. So it's just like, wow, poor, poor Ezra, like you, you get what you want. But again, what is what is the cost of that dream? Um. I did like Thrawn's pragmatism in this episode a lot. I think that, you know, he is a person that is true. Again, we're talking something that's straight from the books and from the interpretation of the animated stuff. Um, you know, I did like that his, he's right, right? He's, um, he had sustainable losses in these, in these battles that happened in this episode, um, but they were acceptable losses and he is right. We have delayed them. We have, the true gift is that we have time. If they stay here, we don't care. There's really no way for them to get back. They don't have a map to get back. All that stuff. It's not like the Purgle are on a one-way trip back and forth and all that stuff. No, this this is this. They're going to be stuck on this planet here and have to deal with all the madness that we perceive it to be. And the only way for them to get back is to be a stowaway on the ship, like Ezra does become, like he does become in this in this in this uh, saga. The last thing I wanted to touch upon in this episode is the splitting of Shin, Hati, and Balin, right? Shin, uh, Balin goes, you're you're on a different path here. Your ambition is, is going elsewhere. And when I watched this the first time, I thought that I kind of interpret, maybe that's just how I interpreted it as, but I thought of it as she was like going on her trial here and he was letting her alone to face this trial on her own. But as I watched it, this is my third, fourth time watching this now and just kind of soaking in the words and the dialogue and seeing the interpretation of, of how they, they acted it out. I'm just like, man, it's clear that their journeys lie on different paths here and their ambition, right? Her Shin Hattie's power and ambition is tied to the empire, right? She thinks once we find Thrawn, 
then we will achieve power, right? We tie ourselves to them. We are a part of them. We are with them. Then we will have power. But Balin, maybe it's just because he wasn't sharing the full picture with her, is like, no, our our power lies in the legends and the myths that lie here, right? He's He's not very coy about what exactly is going on in his plan long term for this matter. Maybe he did at one point, but it's just not presented to the audience, in my opinion. Obviously, we see in the end of episode eight that he's connected to this like Mortis theory or something like that, right? He sees the statues of the Mortis gods. He's literally on the father and he's looking out into the canyon and maybe he's like looking for another path to Mortis that this new galaxy has or something like that, or just the concept of that, the force, the origins of the force, etc. cetera. Um, it's just a clear separation between the two of them. And then what she learns from this is like, she goes with the bandits, she goes with the empire and they have this battle here. She's kind of abandoned. The empire abandons her, right? Thrawn is like, we have acceptable losses. We've lost a few people, but we've delayed them. That was all we really needed to do. Save what we can take them back. Let's go from here. It just shows you again that like, the ambition, the fear, the power, all those dark side traits are lonely. Ahsoka, Sabine, and Ezra, for all that they went through, they still have each other, right? Because they made selfless choices along the way. They were cho- they were there for friends. They were, they were listening to each other. They supported each other. But Balin is like, your ambition lies with them. Go. And then they betray you, right? There's betraying everywhere. It's just one-upping each other, trying to get more power, more power. And that drive for more power and the ambition, which is a key word there, as they discuss uh, in this discussion here, is just, it, that's what it is. It's, it's just a lonely path. So she's on her own lonely path of ambition and power here. Balin goes off on his own lonely path of power and ambition. And Thrawn also is back on his own lonely path of ambition, right? He loses Morgan Elsbeth in episode eight and uh, he's really got nothing around him too. He doesn't even have an empire to, to, to save his, you know, he's, he's not fighting for an emperor, right? What is, what is Thrawn's real end game here to, does he want to be an emperor? Does he know about um, the emperor's kind of contingency plans? Did he know about Operation Cinder? Did he know about the cloning? Did he know about a Project Necromancer? Like these are all questions that exist out there that I have no idea. Um, so these are all my my thoughts and ramblings here. This was a really good episode, a great setup for what will come in episode eight. This was directed, of course, by Gita Van Sat Patel, written by Dave Filoni. I think for Gita, this was the first instance that they have directed a Star Wars project. So glad to see some new faces into the fold here. And of course, this is Dave Filoni's baby, so he's going to touch the writing on every single episode of this project. Really good, really great setup for the next episode, but I think there's a lot of juicy themes there, especially in terms of like light and darkness and, and being with friends and loneliness, right? These, these constant drives of the yin and yang of the light and the dark that we talk about all the time here on Forest Ghost Conversation. So I thank you all for joining me on this journey here. We've got one more to go in our episodic discussions of Ahsoka. And then after that, we will do kind of a full season roundtable discussion. So there's a lot of fun stuff coming down the way, especially just with our special guests over the next couple of weeks. So you don't want to miss out on any of that. So to make sure you don't miss those episodes, be sure to stay subscribed on all of your favorite podcast sites of choice. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the different places. Just search for Force Ghost Conversations. We'll probably be there in some way, shape, or form. You can also connect with us on social media, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Hive. Again, just search Force Ghost Conversations and we'll be there in some capacity. And we'd love to connect with you about Ahsoka and what your thoughts are on this episode. What is Balin's ultimate ambition? What are Shin's uh, how is Shin feeling at this time? What is Thrawn's ultimate goal? Let's let's have a great conversation about all that stuff because there's a lot of juicy things to, to nibble out over the next couple of weeks and months here as we continue to go further into the Ahsoka conversation. Um, we also, if you want to support the show in further ways, we have a Tee Public site, which is where you can find Force Ghost Conversations merchandise, such as t-shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts, all that fun stuff. And they run sales on that site all the time. So if you have a family member that's a fan or a friend that's a, a big fan of Forest Goose Conversations and you think they'd love something like that for a holiday gift or a birthday gift or something like that, then uh, just go check that site out. Also, we have a Patreon site 
where for as little as $1 a month, you can get access to a ton of Forest Ghost Conversations goodies, such as having your name read on the show, getting to ask, ask questions to be answered on the show, sharing Star Wars stories, and uh, extra episodes. So all that is available in the link in the description, and you can see what tier that you potentially want to support at. And of course, if you would like to, you can support us at that level then. So with that, folks, that is all that I had for this week. We'll be back next time with a brand new episode discussing Ahsoka Episode 8. And until then, may the Force be with you. Take care.